Hi folks, good morning. I want to welcome you to Broadband Comes to Harlem. But most of all, I want, to, I want Harlem to welcome both broadband and I want Harlem to welcome you. In the next couple of hours, we'll be showing you a world of possibilities because in many ways, that's what broadband technology is all about, possibilities. When I read uh, Mark Cooper's report and saw the inclusion and exclusion, and we, the rural area, the blacks, and the elders, I couldn't imagine anyone even making that kind of a report, but they did, and they wanted to exclude me and my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, because we know things are moving very rapidly. And uh, I know in today's world, jobs are important. And when I began to see how it was written, the only thing I knew that I had to do something and certainly bring attention. Ms. Rice would not want me to tell you her age, but she did say that her daughter has been married for 56 years, so that will tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why I brought that up, not to embarrass her, because she looks better than all of us, you know that, right? And, and she's walking faster than I am with my um, right knee that's uh, giving me problems. I didn't think it would happen this early, but it has. I think about my grandmother. My grandmother had five siblings, four of whom live within two miles of where we sit. They came up to New York for a better opportunity. They came up to New York because I can speak for my grandmother's experience. She was the eldest of, of, of the, uh, the crew. She was not afforded the opportunity to go beyond the sixth grade. Those of you from the South that, that had family who might have been born in the late 1800s, early 1900s know that there were certain key counties in that state did, that, did not see the benefit of educating people of color. So they gave them the basics so they can, some you know, rudimentary, you know, so they could read or write just enough, just enough to be able to serve their needs. I'm gonna be quite frank. That's why they gave them minimally adequate, and we're still fighting over that, believe it or not, in the South, minimally adequate education. So when I got the opportunity, given that backdrop, to be the most unlikely candidate to be an FCC commissioner, those experiences, and seeing my grandmother struggle sometimes to write a letter to us, struggle sometimes to communicate as her children and her grandchildren, uh, we had our long time, um, struggle to communicate with us effectively. That's why, that should explain to all of you why I am so passionate about these technologies, about high-speed internet and the power that it possesses. Because if my grandmother were, be, were able to visit us today, I would like to think that she would have her granddaughter help her navigate these technological waters in order to help enhance her experiences, help enhance her livelihood, help enhance her health care benefits, help enhance every single aspect of her life. And then the final thing I want to talk about is that the last stage of solving the, the, the broadband adoption problem, the, the, the way that we really need to start addressing this, is going past the technology and thinking about what it does. Thinking about how to put our resources into not just getting people connected to broadband, that is essential, and it has to be affordable and it has to be reliable. But once they get online, we do need to say, how do we use this tool to solve compelling public problems that are now within our reach. So if older adults are isolated, 
once they're online, how do we get people to connect to each other? And what kinds of opportunities exist? You've got uh, AARP has a site called Create the Good that allows people to share their volunteer projects online. Let's get people connected to that. We've got programs out there now where older adults can join together and post information up about their communities, the conditions of their streets. So that can help people use it for something very critical. For health re healthcare, let's get people trained online to use personal health records to manage their health care and communicate with their doctors so that they don't have to go to the emergency room every time a problem starts to emerge, but they can actually address an issue early and have another channel of communication to enhance the services that they're already getting. That's what I see happening in New York today. It's what OATS is starting to do with our, our, our program. For about three or four years, we were teaching a lot of email and internet. Now we're teaching personal health records. We're teaching people to do financial management online. We're teaching 60 and 65 and even 70 year olds how to get jobs using computers and re doing job searches. It's about the social impact. Those seniors that are low income, those seniors that have complex care needs, those that are caregivers, uh, those that have you know, other types of time constraints, they, those would be the people that could most benefit uh, from an expansion of telemedicine in Harlem. And uh, it's really, requires a concerted effort on behalf of the powers that be to make this accessible and also to educate not only the funders and the providers, but the patients themselves. Um, and again, as Ms. Clyburn said, to make something accessible, you've got to make it affordable. Um, in the study that they did, the IdeaTel project, about 93% of the participants in Harlem reported incomes under 20,000 uh, as compared to 50% upstate. 69% of the uh, participants in Harlem were Medicaid eligible versus 14% upstate. And so obviously, you know, that economic disadvantage is a barrier. And so, you know, it's possible for us to appeal to the powers that be here in the government to provide subsidies um, to our seniors to allow them to have these technologies. We really are concerned with the very real issues, the bread and butter issues. We don't have computers, so how can we even worry about the regulation? And when we do have a computer, we're relegated, we're redlined in communities like Harlem to having very slow internet. So by the time I finish speaking, your page might have just changed, right? Or just connected. Exactly. All absolutely real issues. But the point is, is that while we're still struggling on these issues, Congress and the federal government and the FCC are dealing with a whole range of other issues that we need to be so vigilant about, which is why we call it digital justice. We almost came very close to a place in this last week where Representative Henry Waxman introduced a piece of legislation, and in some ways, luckily, he didn't get Republican support for it, but that, if that legislation, and they wanted to try and push this through, the Democrats, while they still have a majority because they're afraid they're gonna lose it in November, this piece of legislation was really geared towards what the Democrats were saying is promoting net neutrality. Now, that's really important. I don't know, anyone in the room heard about net neutrality and the fact that we need it? I'll give you a real quick example. This is what net neutrality is. Right now, if you're lucky enough to have a computer or a phone with the internet, if you're lucky enough to get on the internet, so if you use the internet regularly, think about the pages you go to, right? You should be able to, at this point, go newyorktimes.com or yourcommunityorganization.org, and they should both pop up in the same amount of time. Click on something to change it. They should change at the same rate, depending on your one speed. If we don't have net neutrality, the New York Times, eBay, Facebook, Google, all those big guns that can really afford it will pay the real premium price. They'll get the fast connection speeds. Peoplesproductionhouse.org, public libraries, Harlem Consumer Education Council, your community organization. Basically, most of the places that we might visit on the website will turn into that place where you wait, you wait, you wait. Who's gonna go to a website like that? Nobody. We don't have that time. Nobody's going to sit there and so, so net neutrality on the one hand is really important to keep the internet fair and equitable. So nobody gets to pay more money than somebody else and have a faster site. 
right? That's just one example of why we need net neutrality, and I could go on, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. So just very quickly, the reason why we need to be vigilant is because that piece of legislation might have guaranteed that part of it, but there was other provisions built in, which were concessions to Republicans, that would have meant that the cost that we pay could never be regulated. Now that comes right back full circle to this place of access. So if we're busy just trying to get computers and there's legislation being passed that means the telecommunication company, AT&T, Verizon, they can do whatever they want and charge whatever they want, that just sets us even further back. So hopefully, um, and if any of you want more information, I'd love to take the time to convince you, we need to be really aware of digital justice. We need, to, we need to be representatives of our communities, and senior communities are the most important.